Is there meaning to life then? Uh, there is no objective. I don't believe there's any objective meaning. Uh, I'm saying that we can't use the Bible to, as a sole justification of, of all the claims that it makes. Someone can just say, God has selected me, and then pretty much it'd be like a, like a cult-like scenario, right? Mm -hmm. There'd be many people who would just say, yes, I believe him, he is a messenger of God. Okay, so what we do is we go around, we talk to people about Jesus, God, faith, death, things of that sort. Is there anyone in particular that you want to discuss, or should I pick one for us? Uh, you can pick one for us. Okay, let's go with death. So what I want to know from you is, what do you think happens after you die? Uh, if you want, like, my, like, philosophical answer, it would be, hmm. I think all the energy that, that was put into making me into this world gets put back into it. I think if you want a more realistic answer, it's just lights out. I see. Is there meaning to life then? Uh, there is no objective. I don't believe there's any objective meaning. No. Let's talk about you personally. Is there meaning for your life? No. No? No. Oh, Nick. No, no, no. It's not like depressing or anything. Well, I mean, but like, why? I mean, why study? I mean, why? Why work through uh, pain? Like, why make sacrifices for things at all? Why not always just live for like immediate uh, gratification? It's 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 mostly just like a self-interest sort of virtue. Uh, it's not like I have like any desires to like go out and just do whatever I like whatever I want like at that specific moment. Uh, I do want to live like you know a pretty normal life, get a job, get a job, uh, have someone as a partner, live a normal life. So that's a, that's like a pretty normal thing to want. Surely it is normal. I was pressing in on that because I would argue that you have meaning. And it's not meaning that you create. It's meaning given to you by God, the one who made you. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this kind of talk before? Yeah. So tell me what you understand of Christianity. Uh, Christianity uh, is just based off the teaching of Jesus Christ, uh, who was born roughly around 2,000 years ago. Uh, and just people just interpret his teachings and, and just go off go off their living based off of those, those teachings. Have you ever uh, heard any of his teaching? Like, um, do you do you know anything about what Jesus Christ taught? Uh, you know, like like basic stuff. Uh, turn the other cheek. Uh, I can't really recall like like what his teaching was. I never really got like super big into into Christianity as a child. I appreciate your candor. Well, you're right. Uh, I mean, he, he did say those things, and uh, what you're talking about, he what he was saying is, uh, so, at the time, uh, the Jewish custom of the day, they were saying uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but Christ said, uh, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone desires to sue you and take your, take your coat, let him have your shirt also. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Uh, do, uh, give to him who asks of you and uh, do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now those are all things he taught. Those are uh, ways that we're supposed to live in light of God's truth. But that wasn't the main reason why Christ came. Christ came to preach salvation uh, for repentance and faith in him. Uh, the main thing Jesus was concerned with is our faith. Uh, he wanted us all to know that we stand uh, under God's wrath as it is right now, all of us, until we come uh, to repent and place our faith in Christ. Uh, in John 3.36, uh, Jesus said, uh, for those who believe in the Son have eternal life. Those who do not obey the Son, the wrath of God remains on them. Essentially, we are all sitting under God's wrath it's only because of God's patience and grace that we're, we're not facing it. So once we die, we, we're either, we're gonna stand before God. And if our faith is not in Christ, every single sin, which is every single time we violated God's law and offended God's law, we're gonna have to pay for that sin. The only way we can escape that wrath, which we'll have to pay for eternally, is if someone else pays it. And that's why Christ came because it was appointed, it was prophesied in the scriptures that Christ would come according to the scriptures and he would die according to the scriptures. And he was also raised on the third day by God according to those scriptures as proof 
of his acceptable sacrifice. And so that Jesus came warning everybody that unless we put our faith in him, that we will perish, that we will suffer eternally for our sins against God. And he is our only salvation. He is the only, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what you make of some, what he was telling you. What do you make of that? Uh, it, it's a lot of things that I have heard before. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, I hope I don't just come off rude by saying this. It just sounds like a lot of claims mm -hmm. that it's very hard to justify without the use of the Bible itself. Are you saying the Bible isn't trustworthy? Uh, I'm saying that we can't use the Bible to, as a sole justification of, of all the claims that it makes. Why not? Yeah. Well, when you go, so when you go out and, t so when you believe something, do you just believe the one thing from the one source? So like if I told you I have a invisible, intangible floating unicorn in my garage, would you believe me if, if I'm the only person telling you that? Well, no, no, but there's a difference. The difference is that scripture is God breathed. So we're trusting in the character of the one who wrote it. Mm -hmm. So in your example, you're a guy. We know that people lie. And so you yeah. could be lying. We would want more people to confirm what you're claiming to increase the probability of whether or not we should trust it. But with God, it's different because he never lies. And what we do is we come to the scriptures treating it as the word of God. And then as we examine it, the more that we examine it, the more that we realize it is. Yeah. It's true and true through all the way through. Yeah, can I can I can I throw that back? Sure. Is that scripture uh, was written and interpreted by man though, by a guy, wasn't it? And every single every single translation was just another person who could be implanting their own biases in their own tra in the translations. Well, there's, there's two things, two uh, different problems we can get into there. I know you want to jump on one of them. Yeah. So uh, as far as the translations go, because uh, this is something I've had, uh, you know study myself and uh, hear people who have devoted much more of their lives to the study of scripture. So the way the Bible came about, you know, no one just sat and wrote a book. It's a collection of books mm -hmm. and it was written by over 40 authors. It was written over a period of 1500 years in three different languages. Okay, uh, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, some of it in Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in Greek. But the way that it went, so when the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church of Galatia, they had their letter, okay? And it was copied, okay? It was hand copied, but it was copied by everybody. It was copied and copied and copied and copied. And so because there's so many copies that were written and exchanged and passed along to others, it, it actually verifies the information further. It, it's much more trustworthy than if one person had one copy and completely controlled how that copy was distributed and what it said. So part of the proof of that is that we have so many manuscripts that we can point out when people attempted to mess with the text, when monks were overzealous and added an extra Lord in like a certain verse, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much, we have so much evidence, so many manuscripts that we can point out when that was even attempted. Now at a fundamental level, I would argue that God being all powerful has the ability to use imperfect men to write his perfect message. In the same way that you and I use a pen to write a paper, mm -hmm. God can use people. So we're, again, we're putting our confidence in his character, the fact that he is willing and able to communicate to us, to reveal the truth to us. Okay, so we just need to trust in each other that the people that, that God is selecting is actually being selected by God to write his, his scripture. I'm just not really convinced that, uh, that it's, it, it seems like very easy that like someone can just say that, like someone can just say God has selected me and, th and pretty much it'd be like a, like a cult-like scenario, right? Mm -hmm. There'd be many people who would just say, yes, I believe him, he is a messenger of God. Yeah, that's what happened with Joseph Smith. Yeah. The Mormons. Um, I could give more examples, but to affirm your point, yeah, anybody can claim it. You have to look at the fruit of their life. Mm -hmm. So let me go to the apex uh, of our faith, Christ himself. Jesus himself claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. Mm -hmm. Then examine his life. Is he trustworthy? He healed people. He taught the truth of God. He rose the dead. He himself came back from the dead. 
right? We have reason to trust him. So it's not a blind faith. It's not like, oh, the guy claimed it and then we should just go with it. It's, he claimed it, you examine it, and you realize he is. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. And so you follow him and his apostles. Yeah, but when, when you have a claim that's so extravagant, like bringing someone back from the dead, mm -hmm. you will need some, before you can actually make that claim, something like that impressive of, of a feat, I, I would argue does need some type of scientific evidence, if there's like some way to replicate it. Well, I mean, if, you know, you gotta remember, okay, number one, you're in ancient times, but I think the primary evidence for it is there were, I mean, when uh, Christ was resurrected, there was over 500 people who saw him. Now, you know, if you had 500 people or all these people come and tell you what they saw, if you had people who couldn't see, regain their sight, people who were crippled their whole life suddenly walking, and they're all telling you the same thing, it was that man, Jesus Christ, you know, you're, it, it, the words are gonna start to hold some weight. I mean, we can't go back in time and uh, 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 see these things through a television set. God gave us the scriptures because the scriptures alone are sufficient. Yeah, well, that's the key word. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit. Okay. Um, the most important part is what he came to do. So earlier we were alluding to him being the savior. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask, do you know what we mean by the gospel, the saving message? The good news. Uh, I've, I've, I've heard of the gospel before. It, it's, it's escaping my mind right now. So.